say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two-lane trip of memory into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride. Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America. Hey, good morning, me amigos. Here in my neck of the woods, it uh, looks like spring has sprung. I don't think you could order a better weather from a catalog. But we are beyond dry here. I've said it before and say it again, if I don't get some, we don't get some rain out in this country soon, there's a good chance that this year I'm going to be hunting jerky instead of deer. Hey, good morning, Laura. Jim, how are you doing today? I am so glad that you could join us. On this episode of Coffee with Jim, we're going to do a bit of time travel. And, of course, that means... There will be some road trip inspiration. Thank you, Jim. Speaking of road trip inspiration, I want to thank you, say thank you to the boys of the road crew for a great theme song. <clears throat> Take a listen to their tunes, theme songs for your road trip at roadcrew66.com. Klaus, how are you, sir? Today we're going to step back to one of my favorite Most all of the early named roads are the foundation for the U.S. highway system and they were often linked with the nation's transportation evolution. But the National Old Trails Road took that to another level. And a great example, if you drive the pre-1937 alignment of Route 66 in New Mexico, you can see why. The National Old Trails Road and Route 66 are intertwined on that stretch of scenic road. But in that part of New Mexico, both of those highways are recent history. <clears throat> In San Jose, the little adobe chapel has cast its shadow over the Santa Fe Trail, the National Old Trails Road, and Route 66. The highway passes in front of the Pigeon Ranch, it was established as a hostelry on the Santa Fe Trail, and it served as a field hospital during the Battle of Glorieta Pass in the American Civil War. At Pecos National Historic Park, there are ruins of what the Spanish conquistadors said was the largest city north of Mexico. And of course, then there's old Santa Fe. This is one of the oldest cities in the United States. But before we bark on this morning's odyssey, let me tell you about an incredibly special place, McLean, Texas. It's too big to be considered a ghost town. And it just isn't what it used to be. The population is down by about half since 1950. There used to be a brazier factory in McLean, and as a result, it was jokingly referred to as the uplift capital of America. Well, that old factory is now the home of a Route 66 museum and the Devil's Rope Museum, a surprisingly interesting museum dedicated to barbed wire. And now there's another reason to make a stop in McLean, the mid-1950s Cactus Inn Motel a classic roadside oasis wrapped in a time capsule. Stop by and tell Angela that Jim sent you. 
During the formative years of the uh, American Republic and in the colonial, colonial era, there were efforts to develop official roads, highways, if you will, uh, the National Road, Braddock's Road. Uh, these, there were, these were regional examples. President John Quincy Adams had proposed a series of roads developed and maintained by the government. The first federally funded road in the Southwest was the Beale Wagon Road. This road has kind of a unique place in history. First of all, the survey party was led by the colorful character Edward Fitzgerald Ned Beale. If you enjoy stories of adventure, fearless characters, and exciting exploits. Uh, read about Mr. Beale. You talk about a life well lived. <clears throat> and the Beale Wagon Road is linked to the now legendary Camel Corps. And the Camel Corps is linked to Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, who authorized that project. Davis, as you may recall, later turned his back on the United States and served as President of the Confederate States of America. The development of a federally funded trail system was pushed to the back burner as railroad companies were formed and rails were laid to the most remote communities. By the 1880s, the railroad had supplanted most of the major trails, and in some instances, such as with the Beale Wagon Road, the rails were laid almost on top of the wagon ruts. In 1890, Nearly 41 million people, about 65% of the American population, lived in rural areas. Although many city dwellers had enjoyed free home mail delivery since 1863, rural assistants still had to pick up their mail at the local post office. Well, John Wanamaker, he served as Postmaster General from 1889 to 1893, he was really an innovative fellow probably one of the most innovative to ever lead the post office. Under his leadership, the colonial era of rural mail service was transformed. Working with uh, factions of the Farmers Alliance movement, he garnered federal government support for the funding of an experimental rural free delivery program. Rural carriers would sell stamps and money orders, registered letters, and in short, served as a traveling post office. Linked with this was the development of rural post roads. The initiative continued to evolve in, in the years that followed, and in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson signed into the law a measure, quote, to provide that the United States shall aid states in the construction of rural post roads. These became known as Rural Post Roads Act. These rural post roads were often incorporated into early named auto roads, such as the Ozark Trails. In the area of uh, Bridgeport, a ghost town in Oklahoma, this would later become the course also for the first alignment of Route 66. Further fueling the push for federal funding for development of improved rural roads was the national mania for bicycles in the 1890s and the growth of the League of American Wheelmen. This organization would become a powerful lobbying organization for good roads by 1900. In the book entitled The Kalamazoo Automobilist, author David O'Lyon wrote about bicycle mania in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and the Blood Brothers, manufacturers of bicycles and automobiles. He and he quoted an article written in 1896. The cycle trade is now one of the chief industries of the world. Nearly every season since 1890 has witnessed a doubling of number of our factories. Yet the supply was unequal of the demand. In the book, Lyon also detailed bicycle clubs that organized tours to St. Louis, to Detroit, and even to New York City. But the League of American Wheelmen was soon dwarfed. By 1901, pioneering automobilists such as manufacturer Alexander Winton were attempting to drive from coast to coast, and automobile owners were clamoring for improved speeds, improved roads, excuse me. They began banding together to create organizations such as uh, AAA and the Automobile Club of Southern California and Good Roads Associations. 
These organizations banded with groups that were forming associations to develop highways. But this, of course, required developing partnerships with other organizations and communities, never-ending funding initiatives. Then there was construction, maintenance, and promotion. Auto companies had a vested interest in encouraging long-distance travel, and so they often adopted roads. Uh, this probably won't come as a surprise to learn that many companies were proponents of developing highways. As an example, Henry Joy, president of the Packard Motor Car Company, and Carl G. Fisher, the man who established the Indianapolis Speedway, they were driving forces behind the Lincoln Highway Association. They were not only adamant about building a coast-to-coast -coast road designed specifically for automobiles, but they wanted it to be the first concrete road from New York to San Francisco. They were also instrumental in development of the Dixie Highway. Many of the cooperatives used historic or existent trails in the development of their automobile roads. This provided a lot of opportunity for fundraising. They could link it to history or to patriotism. And uh, many of the trails had been developed to connect population centers over the easiest possible route. So why in reinvent the wheel? But the Daughters of the American Revolution had something grander in mind. They envisioned a coast-to-coast -coast highway that was knit from the country's most historic trails. A sort of a, a bridge between America's past and its future. The very articulate Elizabeth Butler Gentry, she became the face and the voice behind the movement. In the Southwest, the proposed road would also provide access to some of the most scenic and romanticized places in the country. And that, of course, would become a primary promotional tool for the National Old Trails Road as automobile tourism developed. And it would also lay the foundation for the promotion of Route 66 by the U.S. Highway 66 Association after 1927. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Wilby, they set out on what was truly an epic adventure in 1911. Not only did they evaluate the proposed route and alternatives for the National Old Trails Road, they also promoted the National Old Trails Road idea and solicited support and raised funds. On their return, they developed hundreds of photos taken on the trip and created an entrancing presentation about the sites encountered during their odyssey. Then they embarked on a nationwide speaking tour, and they also wrote a book. They uh, generously offered their photos as well as information to an array of publications and gave hundreds of interviews. The fact that Mrs. Willoughby was the first woman to make a more than 10,000-mile transcontinental trip by automobile fueled great interest in their story. Still, development of the National Old Trails Road was contentious. Factions and organizations, communities and companies, they were all building coalitions as they vied for having the route benefit their specific interest. This battle was particularly contentious in the West and Southwest. Communities realized the economic potential represented by the road and tourism so they pulled every string possible to try to garner support for their agenda and have their community included on the route. As an example of the efforts to promote the National Trails Road and to sway decisions was Colonel Potter's trip from Los Angeles to New York. The Los Angeles Times provided the CAR, the Chamber of Commerce and a Consortium of Businesses, funded the trip, and paid for John Zack to serve as their driver and mechanic. They were not only selling and promoting the National Old Trails Road, they were also working to ensure that Los Angeles and not San Diego or San Francisco would be the western terminus. You know, I, I mention often how much this, this period fascinates me, and this is an example. The National Old Trails Road was really the crossroads of the past and future. This is hard to imagine, 
but celebrities such as Buffalo Bill Cody signed on to the project. And Cody would later serve on the National Old Trails Road Board of Directors. Now, the Trail to Sunset. Now, that was one of the more popular auto trails. Uh, by following the trail, motorists could see the Colorado Rockies, the alluring ancient cities in New Mexico, such as Santa Fe, and the scenic wonders of the Southwest. Uh, portions of the Trail of Sunset had been traveled by the Wilbies, as some of the named uh, road incorporated portions of historic trails. Uh, the Trail of Sunset uh, went from Chicago uh, down towards Yuma, Arizona. And uh, interestingly enough, the route began Jackson and Michigan Boulevards in Chicago, uh, just about where the eastern terminus of Route 66 would be in 1926. But aside from AAA and some regional support, the Trail of Sunset lacked the organized backing that was that was enjoyed by all uh, oh, the Jefferson Highway that connected New Orleans with Winnipeg or the Lincoln Highway, the Ocean to Ocean Highway, or the Dixie Highway. And this made maintenance and signage an issue. And this was another argument for including sections of Trail of, to Sunset in the southwest in the National Old Trails Road. Trail to Sunset was the brainchild of adventurer A.L. Westgard. Uh, by training, Westgard was a uh, survey engineer. He was hired by numerous uh, organizations and associations to evaluate and survey best routes for automobile travel. His exploits in the first decades of the 20th century were absolutely legendary. <clears throat> One year, he traveled more than 20,000 miles surveying and mapping routes to the national parks, the scenic attractions, and throughout the West. He created corresponding maps, he wrote dozens of articles, gave interviews, wrote books, and he even filmed some of his adventures. Uh, his books, some have been reprinted and are available on uh, Amazon and other sites they make for great reads. It's, I do not know, I have not found evidence that any of his uh, motion pictures have survived. If anybody has information on that, I'd sure be curious. Aside from Trail to Sunset, uh, Westgard also assisted with the mapping and development of roads, including the National Old Trails Road. And he became a leading promoter as well. For good reason, he was dubbed the Marco Polo of the modern era. You know, and I mentioned his 20,000-mile trip. That was back around 1910. Now, compare that to 1915. Edsel Ford, traveling the National Old Trails Road, considered a drive of 150 miles a good day's run. That makes Westgard's adventures even more amazing. Officially, the course for the National Old Trails Road was pretty much set by uh, 1913. But there was one more uh, pretty dramatic transition that was made shortly afterwards the official opening of the road. Business owners in Kingman and Needles, California, and other communities in Northwest Arizona, including Thomas Devine, father of character actor Andy Devine, uh, and owner of the Hotel Beale in Kingman, Arizona, and members of the Good Roads Association, they petitioned the National Old Trails Road Convention in Kansas City. And as a result, the National Old Trails Road was realigned. Instead of a diagonal course across Arizona following the Trail to Sunset, it now followed the railroad and the Beale Wagon Road. This had a lot of advantages. It allowed for promotion that uh, marketed the National Old Trails Road as the gateway to the wonders of the Southwest, including the Grand Canyon, Painted Desert, Petrified Forest. And it provided the motorist with access to the railroad for the shipping of broken cars, a common problem as the roads were so brutal. And it allowed for the speedy delivery of parts, which were often needed. And of course, along the railroad, there were also 
established hotels and restaurants of pretty good caliber and quality. In reading journals and notes from travelers on the National Old Trails Road, it's interesting to remember that for these folks, the, the, the conditions that we would consider absolutely brutal represented an improved means of transportation and travel for them. Uh, how many of you are familiar with La Biata? That's the steep switchback grade between Santa Fe and Albuquerque. From the perspective of modern eyes, it's, we can't imagine that when this was the National Old Trails Highway and later Route 66, this was an improved highway. Emily Post in her book by Motor to the Golden Gate wrote, the best commentary on the road between Santa Fe and Albuquerque is that it took us less than three hours to make the 66 miles, whereas the 73 miles from Las Vegas to Santa Fe took us nearly six. The Beata Hill, which for days Celia and I dreaded so much that we did not speak of it for fear of making E.M. nervous, was magnificently built. She noted that it was managed as easily as through the driveways of a park. The Arizona Good Roads Association quickly capitalized on the rerouting of the National Old Trails Road across northern Arizona. They published an expansive guidebook with detailed maps, city street maps, advertisements for motels and garages with photographs, and photographs of enticing scenic locations. The book would kind of become a cornerstone of modern tourism in the state of Arizona. Uh, I happen to have a copy of this, and you can find them on eBay. It was reprinted verbatim in the 1980s uh, by Arizona Highways Magazine. You might look for that. I, I travel with it a lot. It's quite a fascinating little book. Uh, shortly after certification of Route 66, the U.S. Highway 66 Association would recycle and repackage many National Old Trails Road promotional campaigns to encourage uh, tourism in northern Arizona, New Mexico, and the California deserts. Even though there was tremendous pride in the National Old Trails Road, when Edsel Ford traveled in the summer of 1915, Arizona had only been a state for a mere three years. The frontier era was a recent memory, and in some places, it was still being lived. Let me uh, just take a second, and I will read you this entry uh, from Edsel Ford's journal from Wednesday, July 14th, 1915. They had been up at the Grand Canyon. At four and a half miles out at 11.15, the Ford broke its rear axle shaft, sent for a new one by hotel chauffeur who happened to come along. When it arrived, we found we had no wheel puller. So could not put the new shaft in. All tossed coin, odd man to walk back to hotel for a wheel puller. Time, Tom Whitehead was odd and he started. After he got back with one, we had difficulty in removing gear from broken shaft, sent it to garage to be put on new shaft by hotel chauffeur, started assembling axle at 6 p.m., went together slowly in the dark, got going at 10.15 p.m. Only food all day was can of beans and box of crackers for three of us. We had a puncture 19 miles from Williams and arrived at 2 a.m. We got good meal at lunch counter, the Harvey Hotel was filled. Sheriff directed us to a third-rate rooming house. Only one room left, occupied by the three of us with one bed. Pretty astounding, huh? And these these were these were guys with money. Money didn't matter. You were you just it was it was tough go. Uh, the Automobile Club of Southern California launched a signage campaign through several states, and the. Uh, Uh, the National Old Trails had, Road had a sub sizable support network. For travelers, the road proved to be quite popular, as there was tremendous interest at that time in the Southwest, fueled by things like uh, 
Emily Post award uh, uh, best-selling book. As a result, other associations often tried to capitalize on the popularity of the National Old Trails Road. Some of the battles went beyond ac accusations and editorials. Some were downright comedic. They included the theft of signs, the rerouting of traffic with detour signs, and other tactics to get the tourist into their community. Though it isn't as popular as Route 66, the National Old Trails Road has its share of fans and enthusiasts. And as with Route 66, there are new chapters and stories being uncovered all the time. I got one personal to share with you, and this is uh, this borders on bizarre, the coincidence behind this. Uh, during the October 2019 uh, speaking tour, I made a stop in Jackson, Michigan, and uh, I uncovered a story that connected the Spartan Company with the National Old Trails Road. In 1911, Spartan uh, of Jackson, Michigan, became one of the first companies to patent and initiate production of electric auto horns. By the mid-teens, they were one of the largest manufacturers of horns in the world. Hudson, Studebaker, and dozens of automobile manufacturers used Spartan horns. In 1916, the company outfitted a one-ton truck, loaded it with signs that read, Safety First, Sound Spartan. And these were placed all along the Lincoln Highway and National Old Trails Highway. Well, shortly after my return to Kingman, I met with Don Gray to examine his extensive collection of photos from, uh, fan, from his family. His grandfather had been a motorcycle and Studebaker dealer in Flagstaff during the teens and 20s. He was also a prolific photographer that traveled throughout northern Arizona and along the National Old Trails Road to California. Well, you can imagine my surprise to find a photo of a Spartan sign along the National Old Trails Road between Ash Fork and Williams, Arizona. So to the best of my knowledge, it's the only photograph uh, I've seen, anyway, of these signs on the National Old Trails Road. The popularity of the National Old Trails Road could not be understated. As I noted earlier, Emily Post traveled much of the road in 1915 and published the book about her exploits. Uh, that book, by the way, in, uh, Motor to the Golden Gate, it's been reprinted and it's available through Amazon. It's a little bit of a tough read. The language is a, a tad bit stilted, but I highly recommend it. Excellent read. Articles published in the Kingman, Arizona newspaper provide a glimpse of traffic growth. A small feature in 1914 noted five cars passing through town in one day. Two, days, two years later, there was enough traffic to warrant establishment of garages, gas stations, and a free public campground. There is so much more to share as the National Old Trails Road and the people who traveled it. The stories are just fascinating. But uh, we're about out of time, and I sure don't want to wear out my welcome by gum beating too long. So before we wrap things up, I want to give a shout out to Root Troop Trip USA. If you're a fan of road trips, uh, such as exploration of the National Old Trails Road and Route 66 or US 6, they are in the memory making business. As a bonus, you can enhance your Route 66 trip by arranging to let me be your guide to historic Kingman, Arizona. Route Trip USA, Steve and his crew can set everything up for you. Just give them a holler. In response to inquiries about signed copies of my books, copies of Murder and Mayhem on the Main Street of America, Tales from Bloody 66, and 100 Things to Do on Route 66 Before You Die, they are available for ordering on our website, jimhinkleysamerica.com. And I want to give a shout out to Connie Eccles of the Wagon Wheel Motel in Cuba, Missouri for her support of our programs. The Wagon Wheel Motel is no mere motel. It is truly a magical place where the past and present blend seamlessly. We always make this a stop on our Route 66 trips. Next week, I will be talking Arizona adventures. 
This means I'll be sharing some of my favorite drives in the Grand Canyon State on paved roads and off, and I will be sharing some interesting stories that I, I'm confident will inspire at least one or two road trips. As always, you have my promise. It will be interesting and informative. I hope that you can join us. And invite your friends, and let's make it a coffee party. Before I get to your questions, just as with PBS, I want to give a hearty thank you to supporters of our crowdfunding initiative. Your dedication and continued support. I just can't imagine Jim Hinckley's America without it. Okay. Hey, let's see who we got today and what kind of questions you got. Well, good morning, Laura. How are you doing today? Mr. Jim Carter, all the way from Kentucky. Laura, uh, yeah, I have an issue with uh, one, of the pro one of the shortcomings with using Facebook Live over Zoom is, uh, and I am working on Zoom, by the way. I haven't quite got that figured out. Um, I cannot do a PowerPoint presentation and face-to-face. -face. It won't let me do both. Klaus is with us all the way from the Netherlands. No, as far as I know, the National Old Trails Road and Old Trails Road were the same, but there was a lot of confliction with uh, naming during that period. Uh, it really gets just convoluted and complicated. Like uh, the road through Oatman was the National Old Trails Road, but the National Old Trails, Trails Road also went through Yucca, for a while, the road through Yucca was the valley cut off. It gets really complicated. Uh, good morning, Bill. Bill, I'm glad you could join us. Klaus, we definitely, if you could box up some of that rain, we could sure use it. Mr. Mike Bayless with us and Keith Kentner, Sandra and Clemens all the way from the Netherlands as well. David, thank you. Yeah, all's well. Every day is good. Uh, uh, some days are just better than others. Well, Andy, that's another one. Ocean to Ocean Highway was down towards uh, uh, Yuma area. And uh, my originally, the National Old Trails Road went through Springerville and go, uh, down that direction to Yuma, connecting with the Ocean to Ocean Highway. Uh, when the Daughters of the Revol American Revolution put in uh, the uh, Madonna of the Trail statues, they put one in each state from Maryland to California, marking the National Old Trails Road commemorating the pioneers. The uh, statue for Arizona is in Springerville, Arizona. And that's a throwback, even though the statue was put in in the 1920s. There was a political dispute with president of the National Trails Highway Association, Harry Truman, and some folks in Kingman, and the statue ended up being on the original alignment of the National Old Trails Road over in Springerville. The Highway of the Padres was a little bit different, uh, but it did connect with the National Old Trails Road. And some of these roads were uh, just like today. You have uh, Highway 93 and I-40 running together. Sometimes you had a lot of these roads uh, going, like in, in California, you had uh, National Old Trails Highway, you had the Grand Canyon Highway, you had the Arrowhead Highway, and they were all like in Goffs, California. Ah, Dries, my friend. Good morning from Sandra, Marion, Clemens, Dries. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, Kalamazoo is great. A uh, tremendous museum there, the Gilmore Complex, and of course the uh, automotive companies like uh, Checker. I was one of the few people crazy enough uh, to write a book about the Checker Cab Manufacturing Company. At the risk of sounding like a name dropper, and uh, that book landed me an interview with uh, Jay Leno in his garage. Fourth and Beale. Well, the National Old Trails Road followed 4th Street south through Kingman 
as did the early alignment of Route 66, and then went out Old Trails Road. I'll have to check uh, my book, my 1914 guidebook on that. Well, Jill, thank you for watching from Chicago. Laura, I did too. But you know, to be honest, Route 66 in many ways is better today than it was in the 1950s and 1960s. You can literally have your cake and eat it too. You can enjoy the road. It's not as congested. And when you're in a hurry, you can jump on the interstate. Uh, no, uh, Mike, Trail to Sunset uh, was uh, kind of a diagonal. Uh, the Grand Army, uh, Grand, let's see, uh, Grand Army of the Republic, was that it? The Grand uh, Repu Army uh, went on to become US 6. In fact, uh, that uh, was name was used after the era of the named roads. Grand Army of the Republic Highway, GAR, the, uh, the, the, the uh, moniker for the uh, uh, Civil War Union Army. Uh, that was used for U.S. 6. Uh, Balancing Rock, I believe that is in Arizona on the National Old Trails Road. Yeah, we could use Emily Post all over again. Uh, Spartan went on to do a lot of things, Maggie. They uh, not only manufactured horns, they were a pioneer in the development of radios, automotive and home radios. And they were also a... Uh, Pioneer in the development of televisions. As early as 1938, they were developing and manufacturing uh, television receivers. It's a good idea. I didn't think of that. Send that along to Lloyd Ganton. He might find that of interest. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, you bet. We're going to have some fun with this Arizona adventure. Yeah, you know, all of these roads, Nolan, uh, there's a lot of guidebooks. Uh, during that period. Just lots. Uh, look for the Blue Book is good. National Old Trails Road had a book. Uh, Trail to Sunset. Uh, almost all of the major named roads had guidebooks and promotional material because uh, there was no federal highway system. And uh, tourism dollars were just as important then as now. So people will... Uh, Gosh, they were they were trying to clamor to get people to follow their road instead of some other road. Klaus, one of these days, and uh, both Route Twenty definitely needs attention. U.S. Six, I have I've talked about uh, U.S. Six a lot, and that road is extremely fascinating. Ninety plus percent of it's intact in it. Uh, uh, by the time it was at its full length, it was the longest highway in America, running from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all the way to Long Beach, California. It was truncated in the 1960s at Bishop, California, and uh, it, it's just a, just a fascinating highway. It was the last U.S. highway to be paved at the uh, Arizona and Utah border. It was uh, 1952 or 53 before it was paved. The Plank Road out of Yuma, I believe, was part of the Ocean to Ocean Highway, Laura. And you can still find some of that. Thomas, that's really intriguing. I, I, uh, I oh, thank you for the compliment. I'd like to talk to you about your uh, art show. Well, Bill Phillip, thank you uh, that uh, on the checker book. Uh, I, I wish I could do it over again. I was under extremely tight uh, editorial constraints on size and editorial content. And the story is so obscure, but since I wrote that book, uh, people have been turning up things. They send me a lot of information. As an example, uh, they sent me a memo, a puzzling memo. And there's all these little puzzle pieces everywhere about checker. But apparently Checker in the 1950s had a test program uh, with diesel engines and they were doing this in the New Orleans area.
Grand Army of the Republic Highway. That's it. Yes. Ah, I cannot pull that name. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, Grand Army of the Republic uh, Highway. That was uh, used for US-6. Before that, it was part of the name, named highways. Klaus, I'll keep that in mind if I can do a book. Ah, 1940 Spartan Radio. Bill, by chance, does that have the, uh, what they called the cat's eye tube, the green tube in the face, where when you got it tuned in, the black bow tie band would come down narrow. I had one of those for a long time. My dad collected radios for a bit and tinkered with them. Uh, I don't know how I'd get them to you, but uh, I have a big box of tubes from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s for old radios. And you're sure welcome to them. Well, folks, we have done beat our gums for 41 minutes. And uh, Laura, it sounds like a great memory. I try to keep this kind of short. I'm always so glad that everybody could join us. I really enjoy our time together. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, but we're going to wrap this up. Lots of new stuff coming down the pike. Lots of things happening. So I am going to bid everyone adios this morning. And until we meet again, mi amigos, take care. And uh, here's the grand adventures and road trips. Vaya con Dios, mi amigos. Adios. Until next week. See you then.